You define a good flight by the negatives. You didn't get hijacked. You didn't crash. You didn't throw up. You weren't late. You weren't nauseated by the food. So you're grateful. Paul Thoreau, The Old Patagonian Express, 1979. Chapter 20, The Jet Age. 20.1, Supersonic. Providing supersonic flight at Mach 2 and travel at 18,000 meters, 11 miles, above the weather, high enough to appreciate the curvature of the Earth, the Concorde just oozed the future. Yet in June 2003, Air France and in October 2003, British Airways retired their Concorde fleet, seven aircraft, a mere 27 years after they started regular service, after serving over 2.5 million passengers. The trend in transportation has been toward steadily higher and higher speeds. So does the retirement of the Concorde without a comparable replacement indicative of the general retrenchment in the aviation industry, or does it suggest cost and technological limits on speed increases? The history of transportation is full of fits and starts. Many U.S. passenger rail routes achieved their highest routine speeds in the 1920s and have yet to match those records. Is the history of supersonic transport different? The Concorde was perhaps the first major technology to be birthed jointly by two governments, the British and the French who in 1956 signed a treaty on the design, development, and manufacturing of a supersonic aircraft within six years. A bit ambitious, the first prototype was rolled out in 1967 in Toulouse, France, and took flight in 1969. In 1973, the Concorde made its first flight to the United States, landing at the new Dallas-Fort Worth airport. By 1976, British Airways began supersonic service between London and Bahrain, and in 1977 from London to New York. The first crash of an Air France Concorde occurred on July 25, 2000, and resulted in a grounding of the fleet until July 17, 2001. The Concorde was the only supersonic passenger craft to get off the drawing boards and into continuing service, though there had been plans for a U.S. supersonic aircraft at around the same time. In 1963, President Kennedy announced that the United States would develop a supersonic transport, or SST. Boeing won the contract over Lockheed in North American aviation, though it turned out to be a Pyrrhic victory. Despite President Nixon's assertion on September 23, 1969, the SST is going to be built. The SST was canceled in 1971 for both market and environmental reasons. There were and are concerns about the effects of sonic booms. Later in the 1990s, NASA, along with Boeing, spent $1 billion designing a high-speed civil transport, which was canceled due to high cost, expected to be $18 billion in development alone, and insufficient expected revenues. The Soviets built the Tu-144, dubbed the Konkordsky, due to its striking similarities with which many assert are due to industrial espionage. The Tu-144 was the first commercial supersonic aircraft flown in 1968. During the 1973 Paris Air Show, the plane crashed, probably because of an unusual maneuver to avoid hitting a French Mirage fighter that was secretly filming it. The French and Soviets colluded to cover up the story, which only was revealed after the end of the Cold War. The Tu-144 did make semi-regular service in the Soviet Union between Moscow and Alma-Ata, Kazakhstan, between 1977 and 1978, but was retired soon after another crash. NASA later cooperated with the Russians to study the Tu-144, reactivating the plane in 1995. Other schemes have been proposed, but none have seen success. The final decision to retire the Concorde is, of course, premised in market economics, which the Concorde, as a state-sponsored enterprise operated by state-sponsored airlines, had been fighting its entire life. The cost of operating the aircraft could not be recovered by fares. Very few people had such high value of time. The year of retirement, 2003, a period of fears about war in Iraq, terrorism due to 9-11, and plague, the SARS virus, along with price volatility in oil, was an era of major troubles for the airlines. U.S. Airways, United Airlines, and Air Canada all went through bankruptcy, and American was tottering on the brink. Rod Eddington, British Airways chief executive, said, This is the end of a fantastic era in world aviation, but bringing forward Concorde's retirement is a prudent business decision at a time when we are having to make difficult decisions right across the airline. In 2010, in the United States, personal expenditures for transportation ran $967 billion, $50 billion of which were for air transportation, about 5%. The activity is relatively small but growing. Total transportation expenditures rose about 20-fold in the last 50 years, but air transportation expenditures grew 75-fold in current dollars. On expenditure grounds, it receives more than its share of attention. Perhaps that's because it is thought that its policy problems are more acute than elsewhere. However, we have difficulty seeing air transportation problems as much different and deeper than problems elsewhere. We think the reasons for relatively high problem visibility and debate include the status of users. The jet set are still image makers, movers, and shakers. 
and the feeling that air service is somehow more vital than other services. And recently, the terrorism issue has made air transportation even more prominent. Twenty point two growth pulses. Even considering the improvements possible, the gas turbine could hardly be considered a feasible application to airplanes, mainly because of the difficulty in complying with the stringent weight requirements. The Gas Turbine Committee of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, 1940. Successful jet engine commercial aircraft came on the market around 1960. The B-707 was the first commercially successful jet aircraft, though the Comet and other aircraft had appeared in Europe earlier. Considerable improvement in service quality, faster, longer stage length, and a smoother ride resulted. The longer runways required for jet aircraft created a problem for airports, as did the need for larger terminals as traffic swelled. To meet airport needs, in 1970, the federal government introduced a tax on tickets and developed an Airports and Airways Trust Fund modeled on the Highway Trust Fund. The figures suggest two growth trajectories or pulses for the air transportation system, one with DC-3 piston-type aircraft, the solid line, another with jet service, the line with triangle markers. We can think of other pulses as the freight system shifted to diesel locomotives and as the nature of the automobile changed in the 1930s, for example. We explore a logistic model for commercial aviation. Our predicted jet era model fit through 2010 data has a very good fit, an R squared of 0.98, if we assume a final market saturation at 1 billion total domestic employments, and we reach within 10% of that value in 2024. This, of course, assumes no change in technology. There were pulses in the equipment component of systems and pulses in regulation, which inspired a major reorganization to a hub-dominated system. But we can think of examples of pulses in other system components. A pulse in a component strains the incremental ways that components grow and develop in relation with each other. For instance, the diesel locomotive, the jet plane, and the interstate strained other components. Reactive public policy was undertaken, policy to ease strains. Another policy question has to do with proactive efforts to achieve a pulse in air transportation. Recalling the strains set off by pulses, should public policy be addressed to more than one component of systems? Is seeking a pulse worthwhile when a system has almost run its growth trajectory? 20.3. Cabotage Cabotage refers in the maritime case to coastal transport within a nation, and nations have long reserved that trade for ships flying their flags. Others may bring their ships to my ports, but they may not carry freight between my ports. That principle is extended to air transport in the early days. For instance, a foreign carrier may not offer service airport to airport within the United States. A carrier can, of course, say fly from San Francisco to New York to Paris, but the carriage of passengers who just want San Francisco to New York service is prohibited, resulting in a waste of resources. The first six airline freedoms described in the list below were defined by the 1944 Chicago Convention of the Provisional International Civil Aviation Organization, which later became a United Nations unit. Later treaties define specific relationships between countries. The United States has established open skies agreements, deregulating international air service, allowing U.S. carriers to fly from any U.S. airport to any European Union airport and vice versa, but still restricting domestic service domestic to domestic carriers, with the European Union, Australia, Switzerland, and Japan. These international open skies agreements guarantee the first through fourth air freedoms. The fifth freedom rights and beyond are not guaranteed by these arrangements, though some airlines have them through separate negotiations. The EU has internal open skies arrangements, which allows up through the eighth freedom, cabotage rights. Australia and New Zealand have a similar arrangement. A treaty between Brunei, Chile, New Zealand, and Singapore also allows cabotage. Generally, this is only permitted on a bilateral or multilateral basis, where two or more countries agree to allow each other's carriers to serve, to serve domestic markets. Airline code sharing is another technique to avoid cabotage restrictions. One policy issue is that of how the principle of cabotage will be resolved as the European Union evolves. Will the EU impose cabotage restrictions on non-EU airlines? If it does, that will hurt U.S. carriers. It might result in pressure to eliminate cabotage restrictions within the United States. The first freedom, called transit freedom, the right to fly and carry traffic over another country without landing. The second freedom, the right to land in another country without boarding or deplaning passengers, for instance, for refueling. The third freedom, the right of an airline from one country to land in a different country and unload passengers from the airline's country. The fourth freedom, the right of an airline from one country to land in a different country and load passengers to the airline's country. The fifth freedom, or beyond rights, 
The right of an airline from one country to land in a second country to then pick up passengers and fly on to a third country where the passengers alight. This has two parts. The intermediate fifth freedom, the right to carry passengers from the home country to the second country, which is implied by the third freedom, and the beyond fifth freedom, the right to carry passengers from the second country to the third country. The sixth freedom, the right to carry traffic from one state through the home country to a third country. The seventh freedom, the right to carry traffic from one state to another state without going through the home country. The eighth freedom, cabotage, the carriage of air traffic that originates and terminates within the boundaries of a given country by an air carrier of another country. Twenty point four Federal Express. The concept is interesting and well formed, but in order to earn better than a C, the idea must be feasible. A Yale University management professor, in response to student Fred Smith's 1965 paper proposing reliable overnight delivery service. This chapter has mostly explored the passenger side of aviation. Freight has tended to stay on the surface. Aside from airmail, the aviation contribution to civilian freight transport until the 1970s was quite small. That was the environment faced when, as noted in the opening quote of this section, Fred Smith, the founder of Federal Express, had trouble convincing his business school professor of the viability of his enterprise. After all, it was both technically difficult to coordinate overnight delivery at an affordable price. If it weren't, wouldn't it have already existed? And there was uncertain demand, since we had instantaneous communications for over a century. What needs to arrive overnight that can't be communicated by telephone? The company began operations in Memphis, Tennessee, April 17, 1973, delivering 186 packages to 25 U.S. cities using 14 Dassault Falcon aircraft. The company grew quickly, especially after the 1977 deregulation of the air freight market. The innovations of Federal Express were several. First was the use of a single national sorting facility in Memphis to assure economies of scale, guaranteeing that there would be at least one connection from every important local distribution center to every other. They used this hub-and-spoke architecture to minimize total flights. For example, the overnight guaranteed shipments can be satisfied with one round trip from every city to Memphis per day, aside from a few of the larger markets. Smaller markets wouldn't necessarily require non-stop service. As a proposition, Federal Express would not succeed unless it began nationally. By its very nature as a last-minute shipping company, the shippers don't have too much time to figure out which company can serve which city overnight. Drop boxes, which were deployed in 1975, eliminated the need for carriers to pick up shipments from each individual, or requiring individuals to travel far to find a pickup site, lowering costs. The use of a Memphis hub led to apocryphal, though likely true stories, that to ship something between offices in the same building in New York City was faster through Memphis than the company mailroom. The company further took advantage of time zones to reuse planes. A plane going east at 4 or 5 a.m. could return to Memphis, reload, and go west in time to do another delivery. This leads to the possibility of same-day delivery in these markets, as there is no reason to have a completely empty plane. An innovation that came soon thereafter was the use of barcode and in-scanning technology, enabling the tracking of individual packages, minimizing losses because someone was responsible for a particular shipment. With the internet, this reassured customers that their shipments were safely making progress. In Chapter 10, we discussed the magic bullet, the positive feedback system that allows new technologies to take off. Perhaps the greatest magic bullet success was Federal Express. Fred Smith, who ranks him along with Juan Tripp, an innovator described in Chapter 4, its developer, had a market niche in mind, and he fought the problem of getting scale to support quality service, a fight that lasted for several years. The technology tailored to scale and market was mostly soft technology, hubbing, efficient sorting, and so on. Privately owned Federal Express has had its own disaster, discussed below, suggesting that sector of the economy, private versus public, is not the only factor in leading to the grail quest of the magic bullet. A point we made in Chapter 10 is that if the wrong path is selected, a pathway disaster may result. An interesting thing about the Federal Express case is that there has been some action by managers that suggests that they may sense they are on the wrong, that they are on the wrong long-run path. In the 1980s, Federal Express invested in electronic document transfer, ZapMail, because of its concern about fax services, but their investment lost $294 million. Federal Express, of course, remains a highly successful enterprise that simply misjudged or mistimed the market, overestimating the number of people wanting to send faxes to people without fax machines, or underestimating how quickly fax machines would be deployed. While as a company, Federal Express has had some stumbles, like ZapMail, it has had for 40 years become an important element in the global transportation communication system to the point that to FedEx is a verb in common speech. 
if not yet in the dictionary. The company has expanded internationally, though not with necessarily the same overnight guarantee, and into ground transportation. Federal Express is given as an example. It has several worthy competitors. United Parcel Service began as a ground-based package company that moved into overnight market following FedEx. Both have seen markets greatly expand with catalogs and then internet commerce as individuals substitute shipping for shopping. Internationally, DHL, now a division of the privatized German post office, Deutsche Post, dominates. DHL was originally founded in 1969 to deliver documents between Hawaii and California. By 2009, the company abandoned domestic pickup and delivery in the U.S. market. In 2016, FedEx acquired TNT. 20.5 20.5 Networked Organization Airlines, even more than other transportation industries, have established highly networked organizations. Two major networks are alliances of the airlines themselves and airline reservation systems. 20.5.1 Alliances Like other transportation industries, airlines have formed alliances to allow better international internetworking, while still keeping individual airlines independent and nationally based. The alliances allow code sharing in which a single airplane carries more than one flight number simultaneously. So you might be a passenger on a Delta booking, your seat mate might be ticketed through KLM. Loyalty or frequent flyer programs are shared or linked, so frequent flyer miles accrued on one alliance partner can be spent on another. Alliance members will often have their gates staffed by partner airlines and be worked on by partner ground crews rather than maintaining such services themselves globally. Partial cross-ownership arrangements sometimes help glue the alliances internally and align interests. That airlines don't just consolidate internationally, which might seem the simpler solution, is driven by policy, especially cabotage policy, and domestic regulation aimed at preserving jobs and flag carriers. Often these objectives are marketed under the guise of security rather than improving customer service. Further slot restrictions at major international hubs, for example London Heathrow, have been used to constrain competition, entrenching incumbents, thus driving up profits. The earliest alliance began in the 1930s between Air New Zealand and its then-parent Pan Am for Latin American flights. In 1989, Northwest and KLM began code-sharing, while KLM acquired 25% of Northwest. This led to an open skies agreement allowing freedom for airlines to provide service between the Netherlands and the United States. American Airlines and British Airways, as well as United and Lufthansa, established similar partnerships. There are now three major international alliances which grew out of earlier bilateral transatlantic relationships. Star Alliance, founded in 1997, is led by United Airlines, SAS, Singapore Airlines, and Lufthansa. Sky Team, founded in 2000, is led by Delta Airlines, Aeromexico, Korean Air, and Air France, KLM. One World, founded in 1999, is led by American Airlines, British Airways, and Cathay Pacific. Membership is not entirely stable, and as airlines merge or are acquired, they may change alliances. 20.5.2 Reservation Systems Airline reservation systems, like urban transportation forecasting models, discussed in Chapter 24, were an early application of information technology to the problems of transportation. The earliest system, Reservisor, 1946, for American Airlines, used an electromechanical machine by, built by Teleregister. Later systems, under the same name, adopted steadily more advanced technology. While originally owned by the airlines themselves, reservation systems were shared with hotel, car rental, and other airlines, and access was given to travel agents. There arose antitrust questions when they, were, when they were used by travel agencies. Would a system owned by Airline A be fair to Airline B? The answer, of course, is no. As with airline mergers, airline reservation systems have formed and been combined into fewer and fewer entities in order to achieve various economies of scale. SABER, which stands for Semi-Automated Business Research Environment, arose in 1964 from American Airlines and today provides the Travelocity service. The Apollo system, formed in 1971 by United Airlines, merged in 1992 with its European competitor Galileo, formed in 1987 with British Airways, KLM, Royal Dutch Airlines, Alitalia, Swiss Air, Austrian Airlines, Olympic, Sabina, Air Portugal, and Aer Lingus, and is now owned by Travelport, which owns a large share of Orbitz. This organization merged in 2006 with Worldspan, formed in 1990 by Delta, Northwest, and TWA as a combination of TWA's PARS system and DATAS, D-A-T-A-S. As of this writing, the same organization still maintains multiple computer reservation systems. Amadeus was a European competitor founded in 1987 with the aim of neutrality by several airlines, Air France, Iberia, Lufthansa, and SAS. Asian Airlines founded the Abacus system. There are others. Notably, the mergers in the reservation system business do not align well with airline alliances. 20.6 
deregulation. Alfred Kahn, 1917 to 2010, a Cornell economist, was chair of the Civil Aeronautics Board during the Carter administration. In his role, he pushed through deregulation of airfares and services, leading to a radical restructuring of what had been a comfortable industry that had captured its regulators to the detriment of consumers. The successful deregulation of airfares led to subsequent deregulation in energy, trucking, railroads, telecommunication, and other industries. While the airlines have been deregulated in terms of prices they can charge and services they can provide within bounds, there are other components of the system that have not been deregulated. Safety standards notably remain. So it's not proper to say that air transportation as a whole has been deregulated. Deregulation was to unleash competition and improve efficiency and service quality. To what extent can that be done through partial deregulation? Although many statements have been made about large consumer savings as a result of deregulation, consultation of data gives fuzzy results. Clearly, the increasing volatility in terms of firm profits, shown in the figure, is an indicator that the industry itself is not making continuously huge profits, and that may indicate underlying instabilities in the market structure. Safety has continued to improve to the point where there are now years with no major commercial airliner crashes, as shown in the figure. While number of deaths is not quite zero, that goal seems feasible. Twenty point seven security theater. The point of terrorism is to cause terror, sometimes to further a political goal, and sometimes out of sheer hatred. The people terrorists kill are not the targets; they are collateral damage. And blowing up planes, trains, markets, or buses is not the goal; those are just tactics. The real targets of terrorism are the rest of us, the billions of us who are not killed but are terrorized because of the killing. The real point of terrorism is not the act itself, but our reaction to the act. And we're doing exactly what the terrorists want. Bruce Schneer, 2006. After 9/11, the U.S. federal government established a Transportation Security Administration (TSA) to oversee airport security, which had been the responsibility of the airports and generally contracted out to private firms. TSA was initially located in the United States Department of Transportation, but was subsequently moved to the newly created U.S. Department of Homeland Security. The politics of security are difficult. If you are in favor of security, you must be in favor of more spending on security or on anything that will keep us safe. If politicians or bureaucrats oppose a proposed security measure and something happens, they will be blamed, as summarized in the table. Security ratchets up quickly. Ratcheting down can only really be done by attrition. Though the increase in security spending post 9/11 exceeds one trillion dollars over ten years, the Department of Homeland Security has systematically failed to study the costs and benefits of proposed security measures, most notably radiation scanners. Other Western countries have similar spending increases. The problem is not just the total, which is large and might be spent in other sectors. The problem is the allocation within the security sphere. If you have one trillion dollars to spend, what is the best way to do that to maximize security? The idea of opportunity cost rises again and again. It is never properly dealt with. Rather than assessing both the probability of an outcome and its cost if it occurs, the agency has dealt with risk qualitatively, imagining worst-case scenarios and engaging in what Cass Sunstein calls probability neglect. The artifice of travelers removing shoes and belts, unpacking suitcases, pouring out liquids while agents frisk grandmas and children, and so on, at security checkpoints has been called security theater because it aims to give travelers the impression that something is being done to improve security when there is no evidence any of this has made any difference. The vector of attack from 9/11, hijacking planes and crashing them into buildings, has been unrepeated not because TSA has ensured safety. Secured cockpit doors and passengers who will not go calmly to their deaths has prevented this from occurring. Other attack vectors that remain, and with a little bit of imagination, you can think of them, are receiving less protection because so much money is spent in response to the previous attack. Though the TSA monitors security, the lines leading up to security are managed by the airport or airlines themselves. And give priority to certain passengers, for instance, first class, though they pay exactly the same amount of security tax as everyone else. This has some analogy with hot lanes, high occupancy toll lanes, described in section 22.4.6. The key difference is that the car in the hot lane pays more money to go faster, while in this case, first class passengers only paid more money for a better seat on the plane. Security is not just an issue on airplanes. Intercity buses and high-speed rail sometimes have security measures, though rarely as stringent. Intercity public transit generally does not, because it would quickly become unworkable. As a consequence, those other modes are much more vulnerable, as shown in the Madrid attacks, March 11, 2004; the London attacks of July 7, 2005; or the Tokyo sarin gas attack of March 20, 1995. Security is the enemy of efficiency. Just as with safety, we want perfect security. 
That goal is unattainable, and security providers should rationally trade off between value of time and value of life. It's icky because people like to think of life as priceless, yet no one acts that way at the margins. People take risks to save time, lower costs, and so on. Accepting that, rather than hiding from it, will move the transportation system toward a less irrational stage on which security theater is enacted. 20.8. Discussion Aviation's first practical civilian use was airmail communications, followed by the substitution of air travel for ship and rail. Recreational flying and some business uses also evolved early. Service today provides much more than substitution, for many aspects of activities have been organized or reorganized and enabled by today's service. Aviation enables new activities that were previously impossible or impractical. In the main, the air system of the early 21st century shares properties of systems previously examined. Its market is not as fully saturated as other modes. International travel is still rising, even if domestic U.S. travel may have plateaued. But the predominant institutional and technological structure seems well established. Less tightly tied to land routes than other systems, rationalization is somewhat different terms than is the case in other systems. It involves sometimes sweeping changes in the geographic structure of services, along with changes in the firms. Gate availability and international negotiation requirements do limit the range of geographic actions possible. The commercial sector is as safe as any mode has ever been, and is improving in private aviation. The airport problem has historic path dependence aspects. Once airports got going, a variety of forces locked in their behaviors, not the least of which was their association with particular cities, big and politically powerful, making location adjustments almost impossible. New airports are difficult to establish both because of opposition from an incumbent airport and airlines not wanting their competition and neighbors not wanting the externalities. Deregulation of routes and fares, but not safety or air traffic control, came along during the Carter administration. Deregulation has had positive and negative effects, and there is discussion of re-regulation. As is the case in all systems, there is the issue of the amount of deregulation achieved. Many airport managers are implementing versions of deregulation, especially by seeking markets and efficiency through adjustments in landing fees and airlines, or seeking equipment and operations protocols tailored to niche markets. For instance, access to services through fractional ownership, rental of business aircraft, executive jets, is enlarging business aircraft services. Ignoring that passengers feel like cattle being driven to slaughter, among the many other indignities suffered while at the airport, one must applaud the airlines. We have no objections to their search for efficiency. Fuel efficiency is a major consideration in aircraft buys. Many airlines are striving to reduce the cost of labor inputs using means over and above specializing or standardizing labor to tasks at efficient scale. At this time in the growth dynamic, we would expect most of the productivity gains from process and product technology to have been captured. Emphasis would be on market channeling. That seems to be the case. Airports, equipment makers, and firms are competing in market channeling or arenas. Hubbing and careful fitting of aircraft to route segments, careful scheduling to maximize the hours per day an aircraft is in profitable use, and the sales of within-cabin seats to market segments, coach, business, and first class, are examples of the way in which air transportation firms attempt to squeeze profitability from a mature technology. The firms are grasping scale economy and market segmentation opportunities. Emerging areas in aviation include UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, while obvious applications like spying or combat have already been employed, there are many potential new markets enabled by this rapidly growing technology, delivery information probes. Supersonic or hypersonic transport. Even if not supersonic, the development of new aircraft requires a multi-billion dollar front-end investment, a sum that extends the reach of a single large company such as Boeing or a consortium like Airbus. A variety of institutional, financial, and technological issues appear. Commercialization of space. Private firms are undertaking rocket launches and placing satellites in orbit and may eventually profitably offer humans the opportunity for space travel. These are still early, early days. Flying cars. The Piper Cub and some other aircraft developed in the 1930s suggested an opening path for a plane-for-anyone society, planes that cost about as much as an automobile and are as easy to operate, if not a plane, then a helicopter or autogyro. That dream held into the 1950s, but the path never opened. The technological advances of self-driving vehicles and UAVs may converge to enable pilotless planes. Alternative fuels. Unlike surface transportation, electrification is not likely to be feasible for aircraft anytime soon. However, research is being undertaken in the use of biofuels to replace jet fuel, reducing environmental impact. Might technological change in the form of a healthy interest in experimental aircraft combined with aircraft control technologies and new materials to yield the long-dreamed of airplane in every garage? Like other technological inevitabilities, picture phones, domestic robots, 
Surely we will obtain this vision, but it may take longer than hoped and may not turn out as expected.